today's Bible study will be done in sign language. Thank you, love. We always just wait a minute. We always just wait a minute for um, people to come. I see my mom's here. I know my wife's coming because she's literally right there. Balloon brother gear. I am what's known as a balloon brother. Balloon brothers are balloon artists that make balloon animals. And we make balloon animals. We do Bible studies. Hey, Mom. Happy Sabbath to you, Mom. Happy Sabbath to you, indeed. We're just going to give it a minute. We'll just give it a minute. Yeah, we had a nice day at church today, huh? Yeah, it did. It was a nice day at church. It wasn't too hot. It was not hot at all. It was a perfect temperature. And it was a good sermon. Yes, it was very good. Very good sermon. I'll just give it a minute. I don't know what time it is, actually. It's about five. About five? Yeah, we'll give it one minute. You do your recap. What did we do last time? We did last time. The plagues. We did the plagues last time. And so to recap on the plagues last time, what we did was we did a Bible study on the plagues of Revelation, uh, Revelation 16. What was the circumstances that caused the plagues to fall in the book of Revelation? And we looked at plagues falling in typology in the Old Testament. And what we saw time and time again was is that there was a religious figurehead who had God's people in bondage. He tried to have an inappropriate relationship with God's people, forcing them to worship contrary to what God's word said, and as a result, plagues fell. Today we're going to be talking about the image of the beast, because as plagues fall, as the plagues, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, they're all connected to each other. So these things are going to happen right around the same time, and as we studied the plagues, we looked and saw what were the circumstances surrounding the plagues in the Old Testament, and what would be the thing that would be the events surrounding the plagues in the future. And we saw that that was a religious political leader that had God's people in bondage, forcing them to worship according to um, his own standard and not the biblical standard. And as a result, plagues fell. And specifically, we saw in, in Exodus chapter 5, that there was anti-Sabbath legislation. And when the anti-Sabbath legislation took place, plagues fell. Today we're going to be talking about the image of the beast. And so before we get started, I ask my wife to come pray. There we go. Everybody knows the pretty lady. And we'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for an opportunity to do Bible study. We want to ask, Lord, for your... Uh, Holy Spirit, to be present with us, to guide us, to teach us, to show us what your word says, and that that would happen in a double portion. So we praise you and thank you for this Holy Sabbath day, and we ask that you would um, surround us and protect us. In your Holy uh, Son's Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, love. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the image of the beast and the plagues and the image of the beast and the mark of the beast. These are very controversial topics. And for the majority of the world, they go by how they feel what these things are. When, if you've been studying with us for a long time, we've only used the Bible to explain Bible. Very, very important that we use Bible to explain Bible. So today we're going to talk about the image of the beast, right? And just a quick recap, we did, last week we did the plagues. And how, what were the circumstances around the plagues? How did they fall? Before that... We looked and saw in the book of Revelation 13, we did two Bible studies. We saw two beasts, beast of the sea, beast of the earth. 
we went and in the Beast of the Sea Bible study, we went back and drew from Old Testament different prophecies that predicted this Antichrist, this little horn power, this man of sin. And we saw that the beast of Revelation 13, 1 to 10, was actually the Antichrist. It was actually the Roman papal uh, ecclesiastical church state. And that this uh, beast of Revelation 13, 1 through 10, the beast of the sea, was the beast that was to precede the beast of the earth. We saw in the following Bible study that the beast of the earth was actually America. And that it was the beast of the earth. It was America that was going to create an image to the first beast and not only create an image to the first beast, but enforce the mark of the first beast. And so we did those Bible studies. And then we jumped into the plagues because the plagues were connected to the image of the beast and the mark of the beast. The plagues, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, they're all connected. They all happen at the same time. And we started with the plagues so that we could see what was the circumstances around the plagues. And again, those circumstances was a political religious figurehead who had God's people in bondage, created legislation forcing God's people to worship contrary to the scriptures, and as a result, plagues fall. And we saw in Exodus chapter 5 specifically the anti-Sabbath legislation um, was involved. And then we did see that uh, the Pope, who is a religious political figurehead, um, has God's people in bondage through the false doctrines that he has um, been uh, promoting for centuries. And that this October 15, 2020, he is going to introduce into the world legislation, which is going to put God's um, holy scriptures uh, secondary to this um, Laodato Si, this climate change movement. And specifically in this legislation, he has a what's called a green Sabbath. And this Sabbath is to be worshipped on the first day, whereas God's um, holy Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. And we saw that when this happens, or when the anti-Sabbath legislation takes place, plagues are going to fall. Now we're going to look and see what is the image of the beast. And so let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And we're going to see something about an image. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. This is very important to understand why we need to be very careful about the image. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Maybe it's 2 Corinthians. Yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says this, But we all, with open face, beholding as, a gla in, as, a, as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So here the scriptures is saying, as we're beholding something, which is the glory of the Lord, we are changed into that image, right? From glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. So as we behold something, we are changed into that image, right? If I'm beholding the Lord, then I am changed into the image of the Lord. But if I'm beholding something else, then I am changed into that image. Let's go and see what the image of the beast is. Revelation chapter 13, verses 14 and 15. It's important to remember, what we behold, what we look at, is what we're changed into, is what image we take on. Revelation 13, 14 and 15. This is what it says, talking about the beast of the earth. This is America. This is something that if you're unaware of, go back and look at that Bible study. Then catch up on this later because it's going to explain what we're talking about now. Now we're talking about America, the beast of the earth, which enforces the image of the beast and the mark of the beast. Revelation 13, 14, and 15. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth, they should make an image to the beast, which had a wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So here we see the beast of the earth. This is America. 
says that it, it creates an image to the beast. And this is what it says in verse 14, that they should make an image to the beast, which had a wound by a sword and did live. Who was the beast that had the wound by the sword and did live? That was the papacy. Go back and look at the Bible study of the beast of the sea, and you'll see that the beast of the sea is the papacy, and that at the end of that beast's time of reigning, it was killed by a sword, by a civil sword and by a religious sword. And says that the image of the beast is created in honor of the first beast. So the second beast creates an image, whatever that is. The image is created for the first beast. And it says in verse 15 that he had power to give life unto the beast, of the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship, the image of the beast should be killed. So America is going to create an image to the beast. This beast is the first beast. So America is going to do something that's going to cause worship to the papacy. And if you don't follow along with this, it says that you will be killed. This is actually pretty scary. So this is something we want to know too, right? Like if we go to Daniel chapter 7, we'll see a list of beasts, right? A lion with eagle's wings, and we'll see a bear, then we'll see a leopard, then we'll see a, a very scary beast. This was uh, representing Rome, pagan Rome. Each one of these beasts conquered the previous beast. So Babylon conquered to become a superpower. Medo-Persia conquered Babylon to become the next superpower. Greece conquered Medo-Persia to become that superpower. And then finally, Rome conquered Greece to become the final superpower. Rome was at, not actually conquered by anybody. Rome dissolved within itself. Rome uh, fell apart all by itself. No one actually conquered Rome. But the, the territories that were left over after Rome had dissolved were taken by um, barbarian tribes. We see that there's a beast of the earth. This is a beast that does not conquer anybody to gain its superpower. And what we see is that this beast of the earth actually helps the first beast of Revelation 13, the beast of the sea, gain its power back. So the beast of the sea, America, is actually going to be the best friend, be the bodyguard, be the enforcer for the papacy. We're going to see that. We're going to see that. And so, um, let's ask ourselves, what does this word image mean, right? Because we don't need to really go off of just my own impression. What do I think? The Bible explains all of this stuff for us. So let's go to the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and see what an image is. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 says this. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle. So here we see that human beings are made in the image of God. And what does that mean? Does that mean we looked exactly like God? Does that mean because we are able to reproduce we're made in the image of God because we have emotional content. We're able to be in the image of God because we're intelligent beings. We're able to be in the image of God. Or does this image represent God's character, right? Because when man was created, he was holy. He was just. He was true. He reflected God's character and man's intentions and man's motivations were good and pure and holy. So when the Bible says that man was created in the image of God, what that means is that man was created with a similar character to what God had. Holy and just and righteous. But something happened. And we see what happens. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Remember when God created man, he made it in his image. And that image reflection was God's character. Man's intentions, man's motivations were always in alignment with what God wanted. But then this happened. Genesis 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast. Remember that. 
The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field of which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, did God really say you can't eat of the fruit of the tree? And what happened? The woman ate of the fruit of the tree and she sinned. And then she gave to her husband and he sinned. Right? Eve was deceived. Adam, he was not deceived. Adam made a choice. Eve was deceived. Adam was actually more in the wrong because he chose to sin, whereas Eve was deceived. But it says that the serpent was a subtle beast of the field. Now, we have a beast. We have a beast of the field. And that beast of the field represents Satan, right? And as Satan possessed this serpent, causing Eve to sin, what happened? Well, that image, right? That image of God that Adam and Eve have, that left. That nature, that perfect nature, that godly nature, that intention, that motivation that was good and holy and just and right that Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve have, that image of God departed. And now whose image did they replace that with? Well, they became sinners. And a sinner has the image of Satan. That's tough to say, but it's absolutely true. So Adam and Eve traded the image of God for the image of the beast, right? S Satan was represented here as a serpent, which was a beast of the field. So they traded their perfect image of God for the image of the beast. Very, very, very deep stuff. So their motivations, their, in their intentions, their character was no longer uh, God-like. It was no longer Christ-like, but it was... Now, sinner, it was sinful, it was satanic. And we want to understand this, right? That the image represents a character, a motivation, intention. And Adam and Eve, who once had the image of God, now had the image of the beast. They had the image of Satan. Now, let's rewind back and go and look at America. And I'm, I'm not um, anti-America. I um, absolutely uh, love my country. I'm very blessed to be here, not because we're a rich country, not because it's a beautiful land. Uh, I feel very fortunate to be here because of the freedoms that we have enjoyed so much. But this second beast of the earth in Revelation 13, 11 to 18, this is America. And this United States of America is going to create the image of the first beast. That's what we read in Revelation 13, 14. They're going to create an image of the first beast. They're going to create an image of Rome, which means if the first beast, now check this out. What was Rome? Rome was a church that lined up with the state. Rome was a church that lined up with the state and they legislated religious worship, which was in opposition to the law of God and with the sword of the state, Rome persecuted God's people when they would not listen to the false doctrines that Rome was pushing. So Rome joined with the, uh, Rome was church and state united. They legislated doctrine that went against the Bible, and when you did not listen to the doctrine that Rome was preaching, you were killed by the state. This is what Rome was. This is what the first beast was. This is the Dark Ages. This is the Inquisition. This is what Rome did for her entire um, existence for the 1,260 years. Rome was a persecuting power that united church and state. So what will the image of the beast be? What will America create? America will create a likeness, a character, a motivation, an intention of the first beast. So America is going to create a church-state union which will legislate apostate worship which will cause God's people to be put in the position 
where they will not accept that. And if you, if the Bible clearly says, Revelation 13, 15, if you don't worship the beast and his image, you're going to die. So America is going to legislate apostate Christianity, specifically Roman Catholicism, which causes and forces the world to worship the first beast, contrary to God's law. Revelation 13, 4. We're going we're gonna to explain how America does that. We're not just saying that. We're going to explain how America does that. But we're going to wait uh, just a moment to explain how it happens. Revelation 13, 4. And this is what happens when this image of the beast is created. When America forces the world through legislation to worship the first beast, which is Rome, this is what takes place. Revelation 13, 4. And I saw one of its heads, as it were, wounded to death, and the deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. This is what happens when America helps the wound heal. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who was able to make war with him? So when you worship the beast, when you worship Roman Catholicism, who are you actually worshipping? Well, you're actually worshipping Satan. Why are you worshipping Satan? Because of the false doctrines that's in Roman Catholicism. I'm not talking about the people. The people are good people. The people that don't know this stuff, God does not hold that against them. Uh, I personally believe that when God says, come out of her, my people, that a majority of God's people are in this church system. And that I believe that they're very sincere people who love Jesus to the best of their knowledge. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about a system that has replaced true worship. And this image, who is worshipped here actually when we are going to this process of the worship of, of the image of the beast? It's actually Satan. And this image is a likeness. It's a character. It's an intention. It's a motivation. So you, the United States of America is going to legislate the United States of America is going to make legislation which transforms the United States of America into a power that enforces worship according to the Roman Catholic Church system. That's a strong thing to say, but I'm going to prove that to you. I'm going to prove it to you. And what is going to happen after that? The Bible clearly says, Revelation 13, verses 15, that if we don't worship the image or the beast or accept his mark, People are going to die. So let's look and see what did Jesus lay out for the humans and say, what is government's role and what is God's role? And for that, we're going to go to Matthew 22, 17 to 22. We're going to see what did Christ say was government's role versus uh, God's role. And we're going to see a, a clear distinction so Matthew 22, 17, here we go, Matthew 22, I got it, I got it, I got it, okay, Matthew 22, this is what it says, Matthew 22, 17 to 22, tell us therefore, what thinkest thou, is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Whose image, whose image and superscription is this? And they said unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Right? Render unto Caesar. Who was Caesar? Caesar was the civil power. Caesar was the government. Then he also goes to say, Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Render unto what the civil government's authority is. Give that to them. But then he goes to say, Render unto God what is God's. This is the separation of church and state. Jesus specifically said these two things need to be separate. They're separate for a reason. And so, Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. The civil power gets what the civil power gets. The divine authority, which is above all, gets the respect, which is above all. Now imagine this conversation didn't just end here. 
Imagine the conversation continues and the Pharisees say, well, what do we render unto God, right? Because we render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and we render unto God what is God's. It doesn't say here what is rendered unto God. But imagine the Pharisees say, what do we render unto God? And Jesus says this, whose image and whose subscription is written on you, right? Because didn't in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 say that the image of God was written in us, right? Jesus, if this conversation would have continued, it could have gone something like, whose image and subscription is on you? We render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, right? We pay taxes. We're obedient to the civil law. And that's what we render to Caesar, right? We pay taxes and we're obedient to the civil law. This is going to sound funny, but if civil law says we make up, we wear a mask, we wear a mask. That's civil law. If civil law says that's just a suggestion, then that's just a suggestion. We don't have to wear one. But if civil law mandates that we wear a civil law, that actually doesn't transgress God's law. So we have to be obedient. I'm not for masks. I don't wear them unless I have to. I'm just saying. I respect other people's wishes and to show respect because I want to be a decent and kind human. I do it. Um, just using that as an example. We render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Taxes and the civil law that does not transgress God's law. We render unto God what is God's. We worship God. We obey God according to the scripture. This is what we render unto God. We worship God according to the scripture. And the two are separate. The civil government has absolutely no say on how I worship God. And God allows the government to be in place to take care of law and order. When the civil power dictates to us how we should worship, when we should worship, who we should worship, we are no longer liable to listen to the civil government. Even if it costs us our life, and chances are if the government is telling you how to worship, when to worship, and who to worship, chances are if you don't obey them, it's going to cost you your life. This will be the mark of the beast controversy. In the future, the beast of the earth is going to create legislation dictating to worship according to the first beast standard. And that legislation will be the mark of the beast. And we will have to um, make a decision. Am I going to follow the civil power when they tell me who to worship, how to worship, and why to worship? Or am I going to use the Holy Scriptures? Am I going to use the Holy Scriptures? Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at typology and see how this end time image of the beast plays out, right? Because we know what the image of the beast is. We know what that is. We know that it's America making legislation that forces the world to worship according to the Roman church state standard. That's what the image of the beast is. That's clearly what we have broke down through the Bible studies over the past one, two, three, four Bible studies. But what are the circumstances that cause that to happen? Are we in the middle of that to happen? Why is the world in America being devastated? Why are we going through such troubling times? Is the situation in America creating such havoc as to cause America to force legislation for morality? Maybe, maybe, maybe the image of the beast is being set up right now. Not actually, but maybe the circumstances around it are being set up right now to force morality around the world. So let's look at typology. Let's look at um, and see what the main example of the image of the beast is. That's in Daniel chapter 3. This is when Nebuchadnezzar sets up the image of gold. And this is where we get our main information from. Daniel chapter 3. And we're going to go to verse 1, verses 4 and 5, verse 12, and verse 14 and 15. We're not going to read the whole thing. But we're going to jump to the main verses. So here we go. Daniel chapter 3, verses uh, 1 
4, 5, 12, 14, 15. Here we go. And this is what it says. It says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, whose height was three score, six cubits, and the breadth thereof, six cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura, in the providence of Babylon. So here we see Babylon, oh, Babylon creates an image of the beast. And it flat, fast forward to the end time. There's an image of the beast that's made. Who makes it? Spiritual Babylon, the apostate Christian world. Here we go. Let's jump down to verses 4 and 5. We have an image. We have an image of Babylon being made. Verses 4 and 5. Then he cried aloud to you, it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. So here, there is a specific time when this image will be set up, and who is to worship? The whole world is to worship. Verse 12. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon. There are certain of God's people which you have set over the affairs of Babylon. There are certain of God's people in the apostate system. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They will not serve your gods nor worship the golden image which you have sent. So there are some obedient people that fear God and his commandments that will refuse to worship the image. Verse 14 and 15, it says this, Nebuchadnezzar made, and Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do you not serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready, that at what time you shall hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sack, but the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music. Ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if you worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? So here we see a progression, an image made, a call to worship, a time to worship, and a group of people who stand faithful for God, who refuse to worship. And then we have immediately, as soon as these three faithfuls are not worshiping, what do we see? We see an immediate persecution of those who want to stand for God. Now, this Nebuchadnezzar, who was he, right? He was the king of Babylon. He was a civil power. He was the person that was to preserve law and order. But he raised up an image and he commanded everyone to worship. Was Nebuchadnezzar, right? He was the civil power. Was Nebuchadnezzar trying to establish a religion? He was trying to establish a religion. Was Nebuchadnezzar trying to establish a religious observance? He was trying to establish a religious observance. Did Nebuchadnezzar have the right to do this? No, absolutely not. He did not have the right to do this. Abs Nebuchadnezzar did, does not have the right to command people to worship. He only had the right to legislate civil power. Stop at a red light. You can't go past 65. If you go past 65, you're going to get a ticket. He only had the right to legislate man-to-man -man interaction. Nebuchadnezzar absolutely did not have the right to command people to worship in any way. But when Nebuchadnezzar established forced worship, what was the immediate result? Nebuchadnezzar forces this worship upon the people, and when people didn't listen, what happened? Immediate persecution took place, right? The three Hebrew faithfuls, what happened to them? They were thrown into the fiery furnace, right? Now, let's ask a question about these three Hebrew faithfuls, right? Were they, were they bad citizens? They were not bad citizens. Were they faithful citizens to the king? They were. Did they respect the king? They did. 
Did they pray for the king? They did. Go back and look at chapter 1. They prayed for the king. Did they obey the legitimate legislation of civil law and order? They did. They absolutely obeyed all of those things. They respected the king. They prayed for the king. They followed the legislation which con uh, of law and order in the land. But when King Nebuchadnezzar, he overstepped his authority and he crossed into the authority of, of what only God can do. And he legislated a religious observance throughout, uh, through the civil power, right? Nebuchadnezzar overstepped his bounds and he legislated a religious observance through civil power. The three Hebrew faithful, um, they became disobedient to the civil power. They had to become disobedient to the civil power or they would have been sinning against God. This is important because it's God's word which gives us through the scriptures what is acceptable worship and what is not acceptable worship. Only God's word has the authority to do that. Civil power never has the ability to supersede or change God's word or in fact um, dictate to us how we should interpret God's word. The civil power does not have that ability. And when the civil power legislates a religious observance, when civil power legislates worship, the faithful to God will practice civil disobedience. I'm not saying rise up and protest. What I'm saying is when this end time scenario takes place and they make legislation that opposes God's word and causes us to worship contrary to what God's word says, our faithful observance to God's word will be civil disobedience. The government has no say in the establishment of religion. This is what the First Amendment is all about. The First Amendment actually comes from Daniel chapter 3. Um, the forefathers of this country knew well enough to separate the two, church and state. They knew well enough that you, the state leaves the, gov, uh, the church alone and the church leaves the state alone. Absolutely. We do not mix these things. Did Nebuchadnezzar have a right to do this? Did Nebuchadnezzar have a right to create an image and have people worship it? Absolutely not. Was, was that an image to the beast? Was that an image to the beast? Daniel chapter 7 verse 23 says, The beast which you saw is a kingdom, is a superpower. That was what Nebuchadnezzar created. It was an image to a beast because he was the king of the country. He was the leader of the superpower. Technically, the image of Nebuchadnezzar was an image to the beast. Daniel chapter 7 calls Babylon a beast, uh, a lion with eagle's wings. What does Babylon stand for, though, right? So we see here Babylon creates an image, and this goes out to the whole world, and the whole world is to say, worship this image, right? But this is an example of greater truth. There's something we need to learn from from this, right? What is Babylon a symbol of? Well, in Revelation 17, verses 1 through 6, it says there's a prostitute, which is a woman, which is an unclean woman, which is an unclean church, and on her head is written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes. So this is a symbol here that Babylon or an apostate church will create an image to the beast. This is what typologically we're looking at. So the end time apostate church. The apostate Christianity is going to make an image to the beast, specifically in America. And yes, I am going to prove it. I'm going to prove it. So did this persecution happen immediately after the image was made? It did. The three Hebrew faithfuls would not worship. And immediately the um, image or the, immediately the persecution took place. And where did their help come from? Did it come from somebody in the government or did it come from God only? It came from God only. So when this takes place, our help is only going to come from God. And we're going to see that in more typology. So was this image that Nebuchadnezzar set up, was it sinful? This image that Nebuchadnezzar set up 
it was sinful because it violated the first two commandments. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me, and thou shalt not make an image and worship it. So this civil leader, <coughs> and, um, he had God's people in bondage. Nebuchadnezzar had was a civil leader. He had God's people in bondage. That's absolutely biblical. And he created legislation that went contrary to God's word, and he forced people to worship. And the, how should I say it? This is what I'll say. This civil leader who had God's people in bondage, created an image, forced people to worship. And essentially what he said was sin by worshiping this image or die. He said sin or die. That's what Nebuchadnezzar said. He said sin or die. And that's one of the reasons why I say it's better to sin or it's better to die than to sin. Nebuchadnezzar said sin or die, right? But what we're doing, what we're going for are the heart and the mind that we want is better to die than sin. So as Nebuchadnezzar said, sin or die, what do we do? What did the Hebrew faithful do? They said it's better to die than sin. That's going to be the heart cry that we do. So the first typological example that we saw was in Daniel 3 with the image of the beast. It was done by Babylon. Typologically, that is the apostate church of the end times. Creates this false worship system. And only a small group of people are not going to fall for it. Let's look in, at another typological instance where God's people create an image and worship it. And let's see why they did it. Let's see why they did it. And we'll use that example and apply it to the future because all these different little puzzle pieces will give us a bigger and greater understanding. So we're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 16 to 20. First, and we're going to see why did they do it? Why did they create an image? Why did they worship it? Here we go. Kings chapter 12, 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 16 to 20. This is what it says. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king saying, okay, check this out. So Solomon died. His son Rehoboam had inherited the kingdom and the people went to Rehoboam and said, listen, we want to follow you, but your father Solomon was too hard on us. Just lighten the burden and we'll gladly follow you. Rehoboam said, I'm not going to lighten the burden. You thought my father's burden was tough. Wait until you see what I'm going to do for you. And as a result, the people rebelled against Rehoboam, except for Judah and Benjamin, and 10 tribes of Israel went and got another king. And so when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered saying, what portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to your own house, David. So Israel departed their tents. As for the children of Israel dwelt in their cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. The king Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones that he died. Therefore the king Rehoboam made speed to get him to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel re rebelled against the house of David unto this day. And it came to pass, when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over Israel. There was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. Okay, so here we go. Rehoboam is rejected as king. Jeroboam is now king of Israel. Rehoboam is king of Judah. Jeroboam is king of the remaining tribes. Let's see what Jeroboam does to create political unity. Jeroboam does something to create political unity. We're going to jump down to verse 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem and Mount Ephraim and dwelt there and went out from there and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. So Jeroboam was scared that the people were going to go back to the house of David. And this is what he did. 
If this people go to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Jeroboam, Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king, Jeroboam, took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is, mu it is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel and the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before one even unto the other at Dan. So Jeroboam, because of political unity, he wanted to have political favor in the eyes of the people. What did he do? He created an image. That's what it says. He made it a golden calf. He made an image of a beast. And he caused the people to sin by forcing a different worship upon the people than what God's word had dictated. God said, you will not make an image. You will not worship an image. You will go to Jerusalem and you'll sacrifice the lamb. And the sacrifice of the lamb, which takes place at Jerusalem, that will be the worship style which you will adhere to. Jeroboam was scared that as the people would go to Jerusalem to follow the word of God, that their hearts would be connected to Jerusalem and the king at Jerusalem. So for political favor, Jeroboam created these images of beasts and caused the people to worship the image of the beast, thus creating sin and having the people turn their backs from God. This is the second example. Jeroboam wanted political unity. And as a result, he created these images of beasts. This is different than what God had set up. God had set up in his word that you will sacrifice the lamb at Jerusalem. Jeroboam created a new system of worship. When Jeroboam created this new false system of worship, it prevented God's people from worshiping in truth and spirit. God's people stand up, right? Because it goes on to say that a prophet had come and he told Jeroboam, what you're doing is wrong. And even as he's speaking, Jeroboam reaches out his hand and says, arrest him. And he had the intentions to kill him. And as Jeroboam reached out his hand, his hand withered. And he went to the prophet and said, pray for me that my hand be restored. And as his hand was restored, he let go of the persecution. And the prophet went away. The prophet was actually destroyed in a few moments later. But Jeroboam, for the sake of political unity, he was the king of Israel. For political unity, he created an image of a beast, which was now specifically going against what God had said was good and right worship. And he caused the people to sin. This is the second example of how the image of the beast is created right? There is a division. There is a war amongst God's people. A new king is selected. And for political opportunity, for political opportunity, he creates an image of the beast for political favor. Very important to understand that as we move on. So at what happened? Uh, this image is set up. People are sinned. A new false system of worship uh, those who protest against it are persecuted. Only God can save them. As the hand was withered and as the prophet was being arrested, it was God who had saved the prophet from being uh, destroyed by the withering of the hand. So we saw two examples. We saw what happened at Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar. We saw what happened in Israel with Jeroboam. Now we're going to look at the golden calf of Exodus. This is also an image to a beast. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the parallels between Moses and Christ real quick. And what we're going to see is that the parallels between Moses and Jesus are, we cannot, um, they're undeniable. They're undeniable in the parallels between Moses and Exodus. And we get a very clear picture of how the image of the beast is created if we look at the chapter themes 
So we're not going to get into particular um, scripture. We're going to look at the theme of the chapter. And we're going to see exactly how. I'm, I'm talking about this is crazy how this image of a beast is created. Exodus chapter 1 verse 32. The chapter themes are going to tell us exactly how the image of the beast is created. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare um, uh, Christ with Moses. And I have some examples of Christ and Moses, the parallels that take place between Christ and Moses. And here we go. So I'm talking about Christ and Moses now. Both Christ and Moses were connected through a um, their birth. Each one was born under a um, death decree. Both spent time in the wilderness. Both dealt with wicked kings. Both dealt with people who had hard hearts. Both were prophets. Both were priests. Both were kings. Both were judges. Both were teachers. Both told wicked men to depart. Both met together on the Mount of Transfiguration. Both were connected through the bronze serpent. Both had the world offered to them. Both were shepherds. Both fasted for 40 days. Both climbed mountains. Both were meek. Both were envied. Both were writers. Both had a connection to the law. Moses wrote the law of ceremony. Jesus wrote the law of Ten Commandments with his finger. Both were subject to controversies concerning their dead bodies. Both had important... Um, important um, dignitaries interested in their in their burial. Moses was an example of Jesus. We're going to see exactly what that means. Moses was an example of uh, Jesus. So as Moses was a type of Christ, we're going to be looking at the chapter themes of Exodus. And as I say Moses, let's also say Jesus. And we're going to see a very um, surreal parallel here. So let's look at the chapter themes of Exodus and we'll see if we can get a bird's eye view of how the image of the beast is created. Okay, so imagine with me Exodus chapter 1 and chapter 2, right? Moses is born and what happens at his birth? He is drawn out of the water. Jesus at his baptism is drawn out of the water. Moses, after he's drawn out of the water, he goes into the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus, after his baptism, goes into the wilderness for 40 days. After the wilderness experience, Moses goes into delivering his people. Jesus, after the wilderness experience, goes into delivering his people. Moses performed miracles while delivering God's people. Jesus performed miracles delivering God's people, right? In Exodus chapter 20, Moses establishes a new covenant. At the cross, Jesus establishes a new covenant. Something very interesting happens in Exodus 24. In Exodus 24, the Bible tells us that Moses went up into a mountain and the scripture says that a cloud received him. Right? The mo in Exodus 24, it says, Moses went up into a mountain and a cloud received him out of the sight of the people. At Christ's ascension, it says that a cloud received him and that he went into the mountain of God. He, heaven is called the mountain of God. So Jesus went into a mountain in a cloud out of the sight of the people. This is very important. Let's look and see how long was Moses in the mountain. Exodus 24, 18. Exodus chapter 24, verse 18. This, this is something right here. I'll tell you that. This is something. Exodus 24, 18 says this. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and get him into the mountain. And Moses was in the mountain 40 days. Moses was in the mountain for 40 days. Let's remember that, that Moses was in the mountain for 40 days. What was Moses doing in the mountain for 40 days? Well, 
for 40 days, Moses was receiving in sanctuary instruction. Exodus chapter 25, Exodus 26, Exodus 27, Exodus 28, Exodus 29, Exodus 30, Exodus 31. Moses is receiving different facets of the sanctuary. Moses is in the mountain for a long time. Moses is in the mountain for 40 days. And Moses is receiving sanctuary instruction. Moses is working in the sanctuary. Check this out. For 40 days. Up to this point, Moses has been a, a, a small example of what Jesus is doing. Is Jesus working in the heavenly sanctuary right now? Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. This is what, this is what the Bible says. This is straight Bible. Now, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Exodus 24, Moses was received into the mountain by a cloud and he goes into sanctuary work. Jesus goes into the mountain of God and is doing sanctuary work. How long was Moses in the mountain? 40 days. Is Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary right now for 40 something? This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Jesus has been in the heavenly sanctuary for 40 something. Check this out. A jubilee is 50 years. A jubilee is a set of seven sevens. And then there's another year added to set the captive free. Jesus has been working in the heavenly sanctuary for 40 jubilees. 40 jubilees. So as Moses was in the mountain working on the sanctuary, in the sanctuary, for 40 days, so too Jesus is working in the heavenly sanctuary for 40 jubilees. 40 times 50 is 2,000. Jesus has been gone for 2,000 years. That's 40 jubilees. That's something to think about. That's something to think about right there. So, what happens... Right, we got all the way up to Exodus 31, right? We saw that all the way up to Exodus 20, it was Moses and Jesus walking side by side. We saw that as Moses in Exodus 24 went into the mountain, was received in the cloud, did the sanctuary service up until chapter 31. So Jesus is in the heavenly sanctuary doing the, the uh, sanctuary service. What happens in Exodus 32? Well, in Exodus 32, the people of God get tired of waiting for Moses. You see, after Moses, after Jesus went into the cloud, they thought that he was going to return quicker than he did. And the children of Israel, now I'm talking about the apostate children of Israel, right? The Babylonian children of Israel. The children of Israel said, we thought Moses, we thought Jesus was coming back sooner than he did, right? And they thought that, their parents thought that, their grandparents thought that Moses was coming back sooner than we thought. We thought Jesus was coming back sooner than we thought, but Moses, he didn't return. Jesus didn't come back when people thought. So while Moses is in the mountain, the children of Israel, the apostate children of Israel, get tired of waiting for Moses, and they decide to create an image to a beast. So the apostate children of Israel make an image of a beast and they begin to worship this image of the beast. And right when everyone least expects it, Moses, Jesus, catches everybody off guard. And those who worship the image of the beast are killed. If you go to... Exodus chapter 32, verse 35. This is what it says. Exodus 32, 35. Here we go. Exodus 32, 35 says this. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf, 
which Aaron made. Here we're talking about an image of the beast that the children of Israel, this was God's people. They said, we're tired of waiting for this Moses. We're tired of waiting for this Jesus. We want something to worship and they create an image of the beast. And what happened? It says that the Lord put plagues on the people because they made the calf, because they made the image. So when this image is made, when the apostate Christian world, which takes, which happens through America, forces this image, plagues are going to fall. That's literally the typological scenario that has just been played out from Exodus chapter 1 to Exodus chapter 32. So much so that it has been almost a word-for-word -word scenario of the life of Jesus through, the, through Moses all the way up until how Jesus was received out of the clouds into the mountain of God as he's doing heavenly sanctuary work until he comes back and catches the people off guard. Same thing is going to happen with us. Same exact thing. This is here for us to learn from so that we don't get caught off guard. These are typological examples of how images are created. America, the beast of the earth, is going to legislate apostate Christianity. And they're going to do it for political favor, just like Jeroboam. And the apostate Christian world is going to get sick and tired of waiting for Jesus. And as he's working in the heavenly sanctuary, the apostate Christian world is going to force the United States government into a position for political favor where they must legislate Christianity. This is what apostate Christians are going to do. And they're going, and if they don't do it, then they'll lose political favor. Isn't that very funny to find ourselves in a very similar position now where the Christian base in America has sway over who's going to be president? And if a, if a president wants political favor, they're going to do what the Christians say. This is some crazy stuff. We see it happening place. We see it taking place right now. This legislation will cause people to sin. When this image of the beast is created, which happens through America, because apostate Christianity is going to force the American government to do this, this legislation puts makes void, null and void the law of God, and it causes the world to sin. So this image of the beast is when America unites church and state, legislating Christianity. And specifically, they're going to legislate Roman Catholic Christianity, which is the Babylon false Christian religion of Revelation 17, 1 to 6. We think, right, we think in America, this is like something we really need to uh, grab now. This is something we really need to grab onto right now. We think that in America, if the government says it will allow prayer back in school, we think that's a good thing. And we put, and we think that it's a good thing if we put on our money in God we trust. And if we, we think it's a good thing if we make legislation against gay marriage. We think it's a good thing if we put the Ten Commandments in courtrooms. We think by doing these things, we're going to create in society a morality by having the government force morality on people, right? But let me tell you, this is super important. What makes people moral is not what the government legislates. What makes people moral is when God gives you the Holy Spirit and writes his law on your heart. It's not what the government does, right? If we say that the government let prayer back in school, tomorrow a new government can take place. And who's to say that they don't decide that you have to pray to a new God? See, that's the thing about government legislating worship. One day, it's all good. The next day, it's something that causes you to be persecuted because it's done by man. Only God can properly dictate to humans the true and right way to worship. And it's God who is the one who gives us the ability to have the Holy Spirit to change the heart and write on our hearts the law of God. We don't when we have the Holy Spirit, when we have 
God's law written on our heart, we don't need human laws. We don't need human laws because we're not going to be hurting each other. We're not going to be stealing from each other. We're not going to be killing each other. We're not going to be lying to each other. We're not going to be murdering each other. We're not going to be stealing each other's wives. We're not going to be stealing each other's stuff, right? But when a government forces morality, and we as Christians think that this is a good thing, that government forcing morality is not a good thing, right? Because Jesus doesn't force himself on us. Jesus doesn't force himself on us. Jesus is a gentleman and knocks on the door of our heart. And if we want Jesus in our heart, we simply open the door. People, and this is this is a hard saying, right? But people don't want Jesus in their heart. This is the truth. People do not want Jesus in their heart. People do not want the Holy Spirit in their heart. People do not want God's law in their heart. I'm talking about I'm talking about Christians. I'm talking about modern day Christians. People do not want God's law in their heart. They do not want the Holy Spirit in their heart to convict them of the sin. They do not want God in their heart. Christians would rather Christians would rather have the government legislate morality for them. Christians would rather have the government legislate morality for them instead of submitting to the word of God and letting the Holy Spirit do the work, the hard work, the gut-wrenching work of removing sin for their life. That is the sad truth of, of the, the world we live in today, that Christianity would rather have the government legislate what's good and right than allow God's word to cut like a sword deep into the heart and let the Holy Spirit work within you a change of character. Because remember, the image is, is a character, it's motivation, it's intention. And this mind frame of forcing the government to do in the human heart only that which the Holy Spirit can do in the heart is going to lead to the image of the beast. I'm going to say that again. The mind frame of forcing the government to do in the human heart that which only the Holy Spirit and the Word of God can do is going to lead to the image of the beast. It's going to lead to the mark of the beast, and it's going to lead to the plagues falling. Christianity has traded Bible-based truth for the prosperity gospel. Instead of having, instead of having the holy light of God's word to direct our feet and to change our character, We'd rather have signs and wonders. And this is very, very sad. Instead of having God's holy light to guide our feet and change our character, we'd rather have signs and wonders. And many Christians go after political involvement. Many Christians go after political involvement thinking that this is going to change people's lives. Political involvement does not change people's lives. The scriptures tell us that the thing that changes people's lives is the sword of the spirit. That's the word of God. When it penetrates into the heart and it cuts you, right? And you repent of your sins and God gives you the Holy Spirit to overcome sin. That's the thing that changes men's heart. What is it that's going to set up this scenario where church and state are combined in America? This is uh, something that we really need to understand because... We're at the verge of this situation where church and state are about to unite in America. What's going to cause this to happen? Well, the truth of the matter is that an economic crash is going to cause this to happen, right? A war that we are going to lose is going to cause this to happen. Political treason is going to cause this to happen. America is being dismantled at the moment. And when it's all said and done, America is going to be left desolate. And when America is left desolate through wars lost, through economic crash, through political treason, which we are about to go through, God has been giving us this time, right? We've been on, um, we've been on lockdown. And we've had the opportunity to repent of our sins, to be converted, and to follow God and worship him in spirit and in truth. As a nation, have we done this? Have we repented? Have we left our sin? 
have we been converted and have we sought God with all our heart, all our mind, and all our soul? Have we began to worship in spirit and truth? We have not. Not as a nation. Individuals have, but not as a nation. And because we refuse to turn from our sin, the inevitable repercussion is going to fall on us. An economic crash, wars that we cannot win, political treason, and a dismantling of everything that we know as a society. I'm not a prophet. I'm simply saying what the Bible has to say typologically because every single time a country turns their back on God, they have an economic crash. They lose in wars. They have political treason and they're broken down and dismantled. And then, only then, do they sit back and say, well, we've really lost our way from God. And what's going to happen when we go through this process? Instead of saying, as an individual, I need to get my right, my life right with God, the American people as a whole are going to force the government to legislate Christianity. And when they do that, they're going to legislate a specific branch of Christianity. That's going to be Roman Catholicism, because that's what the Bible predicts. This is, I'm simply saying what the Bible is predicting. And as this takes place, legislation is going to be created, which is going to cause people like me to be persecuted, right? Because I'm not going to follow along with the image of the beast. I hope you are not either. I'm not going to take the image. I'm not going to take the mark. I'm not going to adhere to a government who enforces worship contrary to the scripture. I'm not going to do it. I hope you're not going to do it either. I really do hope that. And that's what these Bible studies are geared for, for an understanding of what is about to take place. What's about to take place is going to be devastating. We need to take our mind off of this world and we need to set it on the heavenly kingdom. Where Jesus is, that is where our treasure should be. Where our treasure should be is where our heart and mind should be. And so as this country is going to be dismantled through economic crash, through war, through political treason, we are really going to be disappointed if our hearts and minds is not in the heavenly kingdom. And these Bible studies are here they're hard. No one wants to hear this. But this is a warning from the Holy Scriptures. This is a, a warning typologically of what is going to happen. And God is giving us the opportunity to not participate in these things if we take them serious. We got two options. We can get right with the Lord. And the three angels message dictates to us how to get right with God. How to worship spirit and truth. How to not accept the mark of the beast. Or we can go back. We can go back and listen to those sermons that cause us to fall asleep. We can keep thinking that America is going to go back to the way it was and I'll be able to live the next 40 years of just doing and sinning and nothing's going to matter. We, can, we have two options before us, life and death, reality or imagination. And the, these Bible studies are geared for us to get prepared for Jesus' second coming and to reject the mark of the beast. I got two scriptures for you. As we close, I got two scriptures for you as we close. Revelation 14, 9 and 10. Revelation 14, 9 and 10 says this. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. The plagues that we talked about last time, that's the repercussion for accepting the mark of the beast and the image of the beast. We started with the plagues so that when we got to this point right here, you would, you would full well know what the punishment was, right? Now we talked about the image of the beast, the fact that there is going to be this church-state union in America which is going to force the world to worship the first beast through legislation in this country is going to enforce the mark of the beast. Well, next time we'll talk about the mark of the beast. I will not even have to tell you what the mark of the beast is. You can tell me what the mark of the beast is. Go on the computer, go on Google and say, what is the mark of the Roman Catholic Church's authority? You want to know the mark of the beast before next week? Go on the Bible. Because who is the image and worship directed to? that America does, it's directed to the first beast. The image is for the first beast. The power is for the first beast, the Roman Catholic Church. 
You want to know what the mark of the beast is? Look up Roman Catholic Church's mark of authority. When you look it up and when you find out what it is, you won't even believe it. You won't even believe it. But remember, like I said, the plagues fall when anti-Sabbath legislation is enforced. This is not me. This is Bible. I have not said anything of my own opinion through this whole Bible study. Through these series of Bible studies, I hadn't said nothing of my own opinion. I simply laid out what the scriptures had to say typologically, and it's been very clear. So we want to make Jesus happy. We want to worship in spirit and truth. We need to do that according to what the Holy Scripture says, and that's the three angels' message. The last scripture I have for you is this, Revelation 14, verses 12 and 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from this point. Yes, saith the Spirit, they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And I looked and behold a white cloud upon the, uh, one upon the cloud that sat like unto the Son of Man, having his head on his head a golden crown and his in his hand a sharp sickle. Christ is coming back. And he's not coming back as somebody to heal your maladies. He's coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We need to be ready for that. Revelation 15, 2. And I saw, as it were, a glass, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the hearts of God. Do you want to be part of that group of people that get victory over the mark of the beast? over the image of the beast, and over the name of the beast? Well, if you want to do that, there's only one way to do that. That is to get right with Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ is the judge of this earth, and he's going to judge this earth. And unless we submit ourselves to Jesus, right? We've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. We all need to accept the sacrifice, the blood sacrifice. Jesus died for us. That was a blood and bought, blood paid sacrifice. Jesus did that to forgive us of our sins. If we acknowledge that, if we accept that sacrifice, if we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we're forgiven of our sins. And if we come out of the apostate systems, come out of the systems of church, we've all been to church. We've all heard the pastor say things that we know he shouldn't have said. It's time to come out of those things because those things are going to lead to the image of the beast and the mark of the beast. If you don't know how to come out of those things, message me. My name is Bradley Mock. Message me, and we'll, t we'll talk about how to come out of those things. And we'll set you up with a church in your area that preaches the three angels' message. And it's focused on getting our hearts and minds ready for the second coming and rejecting the mark of the beast. There's people around in your area, too, that are doing this. I guarantee it. And then I just want to say, this is a hard message, but don't let this message go by. Don't act like this is nothing. Pretty soon and very soon, we're going to face the king, and we need to be ready for that. So I just want to say I love you. I'm going to ask my wife to come pray. With my beautiful wife. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word, Lord. Sometimes it's hard, and sometimes it's cutting to the heart. But we know that you, when we are cut by your word, it's to heal. So, Heavenly Father, give us the strength. Give us the courage to do that which is right according to the scripture. Help us not to bow to the government or whatever legislation they have, but help us to worship you in truth and spirit so that when you come on the clouds of heaven with your angels in the glory of the Father, that we will be ready. Not only will we be ready, but we'll help others get ready. So, Heavenly Father, give us a double portion of your Holy Spirit. Guide us according to the Bible truth. Help us to let go of anything that is unclean and impure and help us to do your will. And may we praise you and love you and honor you with all that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I love you guys.